Hello everybody, this is uh, Decop, and uh, I am here to read one of my stories, oh, oh sorry, uh, one of my stories, okay, uh, from these ovarian cancer book, uh, called Torch, the name of the book. The name of the story is Counting My Blessings. I was 42 years old. I had no idea I had cancer. I attended a baby shower on October 17, 2005. And when I returned home, I began to have pain in my abdomen. I was unable to sleep all night and contacted the physician on call on Sunday, October 18, 2005. I'm busy. I just said I'm busy, didn't I? Uh, I called my physician. He recommended I go see him that morning. By that Monday morning, my abdomen had started swelling. My regular doctor, Kato, my regular doctor recommended I see my gynecologist after be quiet. After doing so, it was recommended I have a sonogram and a CT scan. Before I received the results of the test, I went to lunch with my mom and sister. As I was eating lunch, I received a phone call from my boss's wife asking how I was doing. She okay. As I was eating lunch, I received a phone call from my boss's wife asking how I was doing. She was vice president of a physician's group for a local hospital system. She recommended I see an oncologist and told me she would make sure I get in to see an oncology specialist. I called and was able to get an appointment. I believe God was working in my life during that during this time. I initially had an appointment with my regular gynecologist who had recommended surgery. Prior to the phone call from my boss's wife, I had planned to have a regular physician perform my surgery and had canceled an appointment with the specialist. After my boss's wife called, I called the specialist back and my appointment had been given to another patient. The nurse said if I could come in at 7.30 a.m. the next Friday, the next morning, which was Friday, October 22nd, 2005, the oncologist would see me. I believe God stepped in at this point to direct my steps. When I arrived, when I arrived at the oncologist's office, I was filling out paperwork. As I was sitting there with my mom and sister, an old friend walked in with his wife. He's a strong Christian man. As soon as he saw me, he hugged me and asked if I was there to see the doctor. I explained that I was. I knew from this point on that there would be more prayers for me. I met with an oncologist who reviewed my test results. He sat with my mom and me and explained that I would require surgery and that he would perform the surgery if I wanted him to. I must be honest and say that I was probably in shock up until this point. I had to have so many tests. At this point, I was nervous as I had lived 42 years without even having any type of surgery and I was facing the prospects of having major surgery. 
My surgery was scheduled for the next Friday, October 29th, 19, uh, 2005. The day arrived for my surgery and I had a migraine. So much stress and not eating the night before the surgery had taken its toll. I arrived at the hospital with my husband, <clears throat> mom, and dad, brothers, sisters, and best friend. When it was time for me to go in to be prepped, my whole family stood up and formed a circle. We held hands while my brother prayed for my safekeeping and a successful surgery. The surgery took longer than expected, and my family was told that I had cancer. My doctor took my mom and husband into a room to tell them the news. My mom told me they both broke down, but they decided together that my mom would tell the rest of the family because Jerry was unable to talk about it at this point. I was finally brought to my room. I was droggy from the anesthesia, but as I was wheeled into my room, I could see in the dim light my family surrounding my bed. My husband Jerry leaned over and with tears in his eyes, he whispered to me, how much he loved me. He then told me that they had found cancer in one of my ovaries. As tears trickled down, trickled out of my eyes, my, my dad leaned over and whispered in my ear that he would trade places with me if he could. I did not realize that while my family was waiting for me to come out of recovery, they had already made a list of who would be staying with me each night in the hospital, as they were going to take turns. When my sister Sherry stayed with me, she helped me bathe. My brother Cliff and my nephew John stayed with me another night. You never, never realize how much love your family has for you until they sacrifice their time and energy to help you get better. I felt so humbled by my family's love and caring attention. Looking back now, I realized that everyone around me was in shock. I know there are certain steps that most people go through when they, found out, when they find out they have cancer. It starts with anger at God and asking, why me? It then moves to feeling sorry for yourself because it ills you. Then on to depression and many other emotions that are hard to deal with. I honestly never explained any of those emotions. My first thought was what to, was to do. My first thought was what do I need to do to fully recover. So I began my ma amazing journey. I think that cancer is often hard on the loved ones around you. The one with cancer is often so involved in fighting the, the disease. Your loved ones often feel helpless in the fight. They struggle with how they can help you. They often don't realize that they're just being there and praying for you daily is the best medicine that they can give. When my oncologist came to see me to explain the results, he told me I had stage 1C ovarian cancer. I asked him what he recommended for my treatment. He said he thought I should have six chemo treatment to kill any cancer cells he may have missed during the surgery. I agreed, then began the long process of recovery from the surgery that I would be ready for chemo. Since my husband worked during the week, we decided that I would stay with my parents during the week so that they could take care of me and that I would go home on the weekends to be with my husband. I must say my mom and dad were the best. I could not have done it without them. Mom made sure I ate well in order to gain back 
some of the weight I lost during my surgery and recovery. We, sh we started walking at the high school track in an afternoon in the afternoons and sitting on the front porch in the evenings. On the weekends, my husband Jerry would stop by and pick me up and take me home. He did all the grocery shopping, house cleaning, and took care of our dog. My dog even mourned, uh, mourned, mourned um, when I was not at home. I was truly blessed. God had much bigger plans for me. I decided before my chemo treatment started that I would shave my head. One of my fears was that I would be standing in the shower and a large clump of my hair would fall out in my hands and I would be devastated. So I made an appointment with my hairdresser to have my head shaved. Another thing I did not realize when I was in surgery was that my family had discussed shaving their heads when it came time for me to have chemo treatments. Um, they did not want me to be alone during that devastating process. I have heard it. It said that a woman's hair is her crowning glory. My mom and sister Diane went with me. My sister brought her camera and a bottle of champagne. My mom decided she would shave her head first before I had to shave mine. She never knew, she will never know how much that meant to me to have her shave, have her show her dis, her support in that way. They made it an adventure filled with laughter and sharing of memories that will live with me forever. My hairdresser gave my mom a mohawk before she shaved all the hair off and we took pictures. When it came time to shave my head, my hairdresser cried because she had been giving me perms and cutting my hair for years. And she was re getting ready to cut all of my curls off. I think it was more devastating to her at the time than it was for me. She shaved. No, okay, okay, let's see. As uh, when I arrived home, let me see. What? Oh, we had another hair shaving party at my mom and dad's house. My brother Cliff brought his clippers and shaved designs on uh, my sister Diane's head. And of course, we took pictures. Then I got to shave my brother's head. Diane was always there to record each event with pictures. In the meantime, my middle sister shaved my niece Rachel's hair off, and she was a senior in high school. She attended her senior prom with very little hair. She had long long, beautiful brown hair that reached to the middle of her back. All her friends at school thought she was ill when she shaved her hair. In my eyes, she was more beautiful than, than, than she had ever been in her life. Uh, my dad went to his hairdresser one day when I was staying with them. He didn't tell mom or me he, what he had intended to do. He told the hairdresser he wanted her to shave his head. She said, do you want a level two or level, a level one or level two shave? That means the level of hair you, you, want, you want to shave off. My dad told her to give him a number zero, no hair. He asked, she asked him several times if he would was sheer before he uh, she shaved him bald. My nephews, David, Jake, John, were 15, 8, and 7 at that time, at the time I was diagnosed. I was afraid I would scare them with not having hair, as they had always known me with long, curly hair. They took it all in stride. 
my oldest nephew, David, let me play golf with him. When my hair started growing back, my nephew, Jake, called me Aunt Diane because with my short hair, I resembled my oldest sister. My nephew, John, made a bear for me. He drew it on paper, and my mom helped him sew it together. We called him Irregular Bear because his arms and legs were different sizes, and his head was not totally round. John wanted a pocket sewn on front with a heart-shaped button. In the pocket, he printed a note that read, I love you, Aunt Bryn. To this day, that bear means so much to me as it shows the love that my nephew had for me. I have many funny stories about this time. I believe if, if you can't see the humor in situations, it will be tougher on you in the long run. One of the funniest stories was when we were at my mom and dad's house one morning and the UPS delivery guy showed up to deliver a package. We heard the knock on the door. Mom thought he was at the back door and dad thought he was at the front. Dad stuck his ball head out of the front door and mom met the guy at the back door with no hat or wig on her head. The UPS guy must have thought we were some type of cult as he took off running to his truck when he saw my dad with his bald head sticking out the front door and my mom answering the, the door with her bald head. As we all had our heads shaved, we picked a Saturday when all my family was in town and my husband was available. We spent five hours taking pictures of, of all of us bald. Those were my most treasured memories. The family and I loved, uh, dearly shaved their heads in support of me. Each time I look at those pictures, I realize that it is not the hair that matters. It's the love that shines from the heart when you see the family you love so much without their hair. How can you measure that much love? I don't think it's possible. After my, after my leave of absence for surgery ended, I returned to full-time work except on the weeks that I had chemo treatments. I thought returning to work would be the most difficult time, and I approached that day with much uh, trepidation. You see, my crowning glory was gone. I had shaved off all my hair and had purchased several wigs to wear. You always think that everyone would be able to tell that you have on a wig. Of course, everyone at work already knew I would lose my hair, but I still had this idea in my head that they didn't know. And I feared I would have to face people who wouldn't know I had cancer and people would point and whisper about the lady with no hair or the funny looking wig. I had lost eight pounds during my leave so very few of my clothes fit. Everything just hung on my body. When I, when I walked in that first day back at work, my boss Brad had a new boss, had a new, had a new boss who he was meeting with that day. When I walked in, he came over and gave me a big bear hug. I say that because my boss is six four. He engulfed me in his huge hug, and tears filled my eyes. I knew at this point that I would be okay coming back to work. My boss was an attorney, so he is normally very stoic and reserved. You could tell he was thrilled that I was back, and that was exactly what I needed. I received more hugs that day than ever before. The support they showed me meant the world to me. I often laughed and joked about my various hats and wigs. 
One day around Christmas, I received a Christmas hat from one of my good friends at work. It had white fur around the brim and a long red pipe cleaner sticking out of the center with a white fur ball on the end. When I walked, when I walked, the ball, the white ball on the top wobbled back and forth. I went in and out of my boss's office. He acted as though he, uh, I hadn't, I didn't have anything unusual on my head. Another day, I wore a, a flower pot hat that my aunt and cousin had sent me during recovery. The hat was in the shape of a flower pot with big long stem flowers sticking out the top. My boss again just walked by my desk, told me good morning, and went right into his office as if I didn't have anything unusual on my head. From that point on, I wore some rather unusual hats just to see if I could get a reaction from him. One of the toughest things about chemo is that it will affect your memory. The reason that this was tough for me was that my memory was one of the things that my boss always complimented me on. It was very difficult for me to remember things he asked me to do. Often when he asked me to do something, I forgot it as soon as I walked out of the office. I started crying. I started carrying a notepad with me every time I went into his office. I wrote everything down. It helped me to remember things. I don't think he ever noticed the difference in my lapses in memory. By the way, my memory improved after my chemo treatment stopped. It took many months, but it did improve. I had six chemotherapy treatments. My mom sat with me through them all. I also had a girlfriend who came and sat with me. She would show up with French toast, bacon, and pancakes for us to eat during my treatments. Uh, because of the chemicals injected into my body, it was hard for me to be hungry for anything. Every time I ate, every time I ate had a, a chemical metallic taste. But Jan would always bring me something to eat. My mom always packed a bag with snacks for me. On those days, we sat and talked and shared many memories. It had become a tradition for me to cook dressing for our Thanksgiving holiday. I am from Louisiana, so everything I cook has a Cajun flavor. This was the first year that I did not have the energy to cook. My mom, sister Sherry, and older sister Diane did the cooking. It was odd not helping with any of the cooking. We celebrated Thanksgiving with family and friends. Christmas was really special. We draw names for gifts in our family. My brother had drawn my sister's name. Her gift was framed picture of our, fo our family photo session. Uh, uh, let's see, bald is beautiful. When you see the love that shines through when your family has no hair, it is an amazing thing. It puts everything else into perspective. Everything else is small stuff compared to your journey with cancer. The week of my third treatment, my grandmother passed away. This was a sad time as I had not been able to visit her in the nursing home since my surgery and chemo treatment. I had a treatment on Friday on Saturday, I rode with my parents for six hours back to Lake Charles, Louisiana to attend the funeral. Hurricane Rita, Hurricane Rita had just hit the Gulf Coast and Lake Charles in particular. There was so much damage in the area where my grandmother would be buried that there were no hotels within a hundred miles. 
we had to stay in a hotel in Lafayette an hour and a half away to complete the funeral arrangements. We had to drive back and forth to and from our hotel for several days. My grandmother's request was that her granddaughter's nieces and great niece be pallbearers at her funeral. That Tuesday, I was able to be a pallbearer for my grandmother. I still, I can still picture my sister, cousins, and niece all dressed in black, carrying my grandmother's casket. It had been an emotional journey. The fourth treatment came along. I was more tired than usual. I did not realize that I had had a bleeding ulcer. On Tuesday after treatment, I woke up not feeling well. I could not walk without getting dizzy. I called my doctor and the nurse asked me to come in immediately. My blood count was so low, they checked me directly into the hospital from the physician's office. I was given two pints, two pints of blood and scheduled for a scope. They found the ulcer. Uh, Casterized it and then released me on Friday. I was back at work the following Monday. I never missed the treatment until the last one. My blood counts were too low. I had worn my special flower pot hat for the final one. I had to I had to go home and try next week next and try again in a week. I arrived for my treatment again and and still my counts were too low. Each time I had to call my husband to tell him it was postponed again. I could tell he was more worried than ever before. Finally, I arrived the next week and my counts were good enough to do the treatment. I called my husband to let him know he just broke down and cried. That evening after treatment, I went home and sat down with my husband. I had not realized until that moment how hard the treatment and cancer had been on him. He had been trying to be strong for me, but at the same time, he sat on the couch every night worrying and praying. I finally understood what this whole process had done to him. And his being strong for me he had been holding in all his worries and fears. That night, he broke down and cried over his fear of losing me. I explained to him that if God saw fit to take me from this world, I was ready. And that is what gave me peace through uh, the whole process. Being human, my husband told me that I'm might be ready for that time. No, no, no. I explained to him that if God saw me fit to take me from this world, I was ready, and that is what gave me peace through the whole process. Being human, my husband told me that I might be ready for that time, but he certainly was not, wasn't ready for me to go. I explained to him that he needed to talk to me about his fears and worries because I could not make it through this journey without him. I completed my chemo treatment in March 2006. I had my one-year checkup in March 2007, and I continued to improve every day. This cancer journey has taken me to places I never dreamed. I consider it a blessing from God that I have taken this walk with him. I thank my family, friends, and all those who prayed for me during this time and have continued to celebrate the many milestones that have occurred since then. There were many who prayed for me whom I have never met. I hope one day to meet each of you and thank you personally for the prayers. I could not have made this journey without you. I believe God allowed this to happen to me for a reason. 
and prayer played a large part in my healing. It made me and the people around me more aware of the wonderful thing he gives us called life. This life I live on earth is by no means the best place I will ever see. One day God will call me home and what a blessed place that will be. What a blessed life I have lived. And this is the story of um, Brenda, Brenda Edwards. Uh, this is her uh, the su survival story. Uh, there was some. I always like to try and um, tell, uh, tell just in case I help anybody new uh, that look at my videos, listen to my video to my readings, uh, where there are no um, symptoms of ovarian cancer. Uh, this is not my list, but I'm gonna, uh, hopefully I can remember. Um, uh, okay. Now I've been holding one minute. Let me try to get some. <laughs> First, first um, symptom of ovarian cancer is uh, bloating, swollen tummy pains, backache, irregular cycle, fatigue, uh, full after eating small amounts, or feeling of fullness when you when you're eating, tuberculosis. Um, painful intercourse, constipation, or diarrhea, indigestion, increased urination, lung issues, and those are the 13 um, symptoms of ovarian cancer. And uh, here is the two. There's uh, one test that's for that will tell you if you have ovarian cancer, and it's called CA125. CA125. That's the blood test. It's a blood test that can be given to uh, let you know if you have ovarian cancer. Uh, the test for breast cancer to see if you have breast cancer or you carry the genes. It's called BRAC. It's B-R-A-C. I think they have a 1 and a 2. So BRAC 1 and BRAC 2. Um, and the 3 um, three things, 3 not, uh, tests, uh, well, not, not actual tests, that they send you to to, um, to be able to uh, like Look into your tummy and see if you have um, um, any cancer. And that's an uh, ultrasound, a CT scan, a sonogram, and a PET, PET scan. And the three um, things that they normally do for your cancer, you either take chemo uh, and radiation, or some people just take chemo. And the other, the third one is you can, um, you can do the uh, trials, the drugs trials uh, that uh, basically, you know, is part of the um, cure for your, uh, your cancer. So that is, and I also have those. Uh, the symptoms of ovarian cancer on my community page uh, for YouTube. 
you just go to my community page and you will see what I just uh, told you about the, th the, the symptoms, the name of the two tests for one for ovarian, one for breast cancer, and the ultrasound, those tests that they give you, and also the medication that they use to um, cure uh, your cancer. Um, it was something else I was going to, um, oh, I know what it is. Uh, today is the, is January 12th, and, uh, this is a Sunday. So, uh, starting Monday, I'm not sure what day is I'm going to do it, but I'm going to, uh, have a panel, and, uh, and hopefully, uh, of women that have either breast cancer or ovarian cancer, they have cysts on the ovary, they have kidney cancer, whatever kind of uh, cancer um, that they've had. And we're going to be on the panel talking about the, the symptoms and uh, what they went through, um, survival stories. Um, People that have had uh, sisters or mothers or something that have had cancer and they can talk about, uh, you know, what they went through, what the the person with the cancer went through. And uh, we're going to do that. I'm not sure, but uh, stay tuned. I'll, uh, when I find out exactly the date, uh, what day and the time, I will definitely put it out. Uh, Check my community page, and I I'll put that put it on there, and then I will put out the um, a string yard um, link, and you can come on and if you have something to say or talk about, of course since the ask, you can uh, join uh, or just chat from the chat room. So I appreciate your time. Uh, I think that was it, and I just want to say thank y'all for um, for those people that uh, have stuck with me during this book book reading. Um, my uh, my wife passed away with ovarian cancer in two thousand and fourteen. Um, she was also like the rest of the ladies in the book. Uh, was misdiagnosed and um, instead of l living the I think four to six months they gave her she lived seven years um, so yeah so that's it and I hope to see y'all soon I appreciate you and I'm out of here